Welcome, welcome. Everybody is welcome. Nice to see you all this morning. We are studying the book of John. Today we are in chapter 18. It uh, is referred to as Jesus' high priestly prayer. The whole chapter is Jesus praying. There's really an ocean of messages in that one chapter, but we're just going to look at a drop, one drop this morning. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this morning and, and the opportunity to come together and worship you. Be among us, Father. Uh, be with us. Teach us this morning. May our hearts be open as we know that you have something to say to us and, and uh, say it now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be reading from John 17, starting at verse 13. It says, I'm coming to you now, Jesus is praying when he says this, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I've given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is God's word. So we see Jesus' prayer. Um, just a couple of key things we're going to look at this morning. Jesus prays, and the first thing he prays for is that we would fulfill our purpose. What is our purpose? Why are we here in a world without God, it's a world without purpose. It's a world without meaning. It doesn't make any difference, quite honestly, if I live or I die. If I'm depressed and I want to take my life, what does it matter? I'm just a bunch of cells that came into this world. I have no meaning. I have no purpose. I don't think anybody truly believes that. Even an atheist, I don't think truly believes that life is meaningless. People just don't live that way. And yet that's the case if there is no God. To have purpose, to have meaningful work to do, to somehow contribute to the common good, this is a gift from God. It's our glory that we can fulfill a purpose. And I just want to be cautious here because that may imply that somebody, let's say, who is a paraplegic, who is limited, very limited in what they can contribute, has no worth or value. I'm not saying that at all. A human being has life simply because they're a human being. But if we are able and capable of giving and contributing to the common good, then that is a gift to us. We have purpose. God has a purpose for us. Jesus prayed to his father. He said, I don't pray that you take them out of the world. Why did he pray that? I mean, wouldn't it be better for us to go to heaven and be away from all this trouble? We didn't pray that because there's work that needs doing. There's babies. We have babies here. Babies, in case you've forgotten the old thoughts that babies need care. They need a lot of care. All the time they need care. Diapers have to be changed. Somebody has to do it. Um, Poppy, you got to change them once in a while. Some, some grandparents are reluctant to change diapers. 
for some reason. <laughs> but they got to be changed, nevertheless. Babies need care. The church needs to be set up. It, it may seem like it sets up itself because most of us come and there it is. As though by magic, the, the setup fairies did it. Well, it really doesn't work that way. That's a need we have, quite honestly. It falls on very few shoulders that, that do that. We could use some help with that. In fact, we need help after service today because the guy, the custodian who regularly does it, he's in the Philippines, is that right? He's gone on a trip to the Philippines. He goes for about a month every year. Which means we have to do it. He normally does it. So we can use the, an extra hand after church. If we all do it together, it'll be quick and easy. Now these things, caring for a child, setting up the church, they're not burdens. They're not obstructions in the way of getting to the real purpose God has for us. That is God's work. These things are God's work. They're, they give God glory, and they're meant to give us joy as we participate in them. Kim Kardashian, I think you all know, she's famous for nothing, right? For having really actually have done nothing. She's kind of famous for being famous. But now she's used her fame. She's found purpose. Her husband... What's his name again? Kanye West. Whoa, you guys are woke. You guys are woke, this crowd. It appears that he's found God. I mean, I'm a little cautious. I, I'm not saying he hasn't, but I want to wait and see if it's for real. But it appears that he has. And now his wife, famous for doing nothing other than being rich, now is advocating for other people. She has a, a purpose. She's using her fame for more than just herself, she's found a purpose. Now, Jesus said, just as the Father sent him, he is sending us. So our work, our work, the work that God left us here to do is to do what Jesus did. And we do that in two ways. And the first is this, we live the truth. We have to live the truth. See, Jesus said, I don't pray, Father, that you take them out of the world, but I pray that you protect them from the evil one which means that Jesus is sending us into enemy territory, right? You don't need protection in your own kingdom, right? There's no enemy there. But if you go into the enemy's territory, you need protection. That's what God's doing. He's sending us into the enemy's territory. And the world needs truth. It needs the truth about God. It needs the truth about Jesus Christ. I was listening to a, a, a podcast this week. I drive a lot for work, so I get to listen. Uh, I listen to a message by Pastor Tim Keller. He's a pastor in New York City. And he's talking about as the, the quality of the city, the quality of life in New York City, Christians are tending to leave the city. They want to go out of the city. And he's saying that's the exact opposite of what a Christian should do. As the city gets worse, the Christian should be going into the city it's becoming darker. It needs light more and more. The response of a Christian is not to run from darkness or evil, and I'm not talking about being foolish, but that's where we should be going to. That's what we're called to do. Think of, let's put it in the context of, of our local culture. Think of Father Damien. Leprosy was um, a plague that came into the, the state, and we all know that they sent them to Kalapapa, right? They... They were sent to their own community on Molokai, and it was, it was a bad environment. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of, I mean, this terrible things were taking, it was lawless. I mean, these people are just, they're despondent, they have this horrible disease, and he didn't avoid it, he went there. He didn't just go visit, he moved there, he lived there among them, he was called. Didn't he do what Jesus did? Jesus is safe in heaven. The world is full of sin and evil. I don't want to go there, but that's exactly where he went. Kalapapa's filled with leprosy. He didn't avoid it. He went there to bring the light of God to there. And ultimately, he contracted the disease himself. That's what we're called to do. That's, that's our purpose here. And the most dangerous weapon that our enemy has is lies. It's lies is to distort the truth. Before, it was a fundamental belief of all people that there was a God. There was a God. They may have disagreed on exactly what it was. But now, there's the lie that there is no God. 
That's a lie. That is a lie. And it changes everything, our attitude, our belief, the way we act. It fundamentally changes everything. There's a lie that, that uh, a woman or a baby in utero is just, it's just a clump of cells, not a person. That's a lie. If we say it's a person, people's attitude would change. And the good thing is young people generally are opposing abortion more and more, young people. Why? Because we know more and more. Science is telling us this is a human being at conception. There's zero question that's the truth. Life begins at conception. But if it's promoted as, well, it's your choice. It's just a clump of cells. It's easy to kill that. But it's a human being. So the, the strongest weapon the enemy has is lies. And ours is the truth. More than one, the truth is called our sword. We fight with the truth. We were... Uh, had a mini church this week, and somebody was talking about the Philippine mission that we went on. They shared, you know, when I go on that mission, my faith gets stronger. And they, I don't know why, but I think, I think it's because when we act on the truth, we put our faith into action, of course it gets stronger, right? God has told us, it's not in everybody, the top of everybody's list, I want to go to the Philippines. They have funky food, they, right? All this, right? That's not on the top of everybody's list. So why do we do it? Because God told us to. We're putting our faith into action. That's why I really, I encourage everybody, if you don't tithe, I encourage you to do it. I don't know anybody who has said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out in faith. I'm going to give God 10%. I'll see what happens. Never, it could be possible. I've never heard anybody come back and say, wow, man, I'm, I'm going bankrupt. So I gave God 10%, it's all over, financial disaster. Never, ever heard that. Everybody, everybody has seen the blessing of God. And those people that do it, their faith grows, right? Because I stepped out in faith. I don't see how this can work, but I did it. And I didn't collapse. I mean, that's what happened. Um, and, and it can be incremental. I've told the story before. I, I had a business, I had a failing business. I was asking for God's help, and I knew I had to somehow step out in faith financially. I just gave him five bucks a week, five bucks a week. I didn't have five bucks, really, not on paper I didn't. But I tried it. Wow, things didn't become a disaster. Now, my expectation was God will bless me financially. My business will boom. That's the opposite of what happened. Business went down. But God taught me to manage my money better. That's what I needed. And my profits went up. My overall income, gross income went down, but my percentage of profit went up. God taught me how to use my money. And it's because I stepped out in faith to begin with. So we are here to help others to believe, to bring light to the darkness. Another podcast I listened to this week talked about there, there's a ministry sending Christians to the Middle East. To the Middle East which is Muslim territory, right? They don't not just believe in Christianity, they kill Christians, a lot of them. I mean, not entirely, it's not pervasive, but it, it happens. These people, the, the condition is you have to sell everything you have and go and move there and commit to ministering to these people. People are doing it. Christians are doing that. Are we willing to do that? If God were to tell us, I'm not saying God is telling every Christian to do that, he's not. But if you were even telling us that, would we know? Are we open to that? Are we open to God directing us and sending us where he wants to go? Coronavirus, it's here. It's affecting the world. It's affecting the world. How should Christians respond to that? Should we be hoarding toilet paper, right? Is that what, we are? Is that what we're meant to do? Now, I'm not saying don't make preparations, but should Christians be at peace when others are panicking? Right? Should, and is it really something worth panicking over? I don't think it is at this point. Potentially it could be. How should we respond? Ephesians 4, 15 and 16 says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Jesus said we are to be sanctified. That's what it means to be a Christian. 
he's not perfect from the beginning, but he's in the process of perfecting us. He's changing us. And so that's the second thing that we do. As Christians, um, Jesus prays that we would be united. And in two ways, the first is to each other. So earlier in the book of John, before we got to this part, you know what, what was the defining characteristic? Jesus told his followers, look, there's this one thing that people will know you're my follower, one thing. They'll see that and they'll know you're my follower. What was it? Your love for one another. By your love for one another, that's how people will know you're a Christian. That's how they'll know you're my follower. Our unity amongst each other declares the truth that God is good. And if that's what Jesus wants more than anything else is our unity, where do you think the devil will attack first? Where will he attack first? He wants disruption among God's people. He doesn't want unity. He doesn't want intimacy. He wants to keep us separated. Now, when the church first started, the church, Jesus had gone to heaven, um, Pentecost came, the Holy Spirit. How does the, the Bible describe them in the book of Acts? It said they had everything in common. So if anybody had a need, the guy who had it, I'll sell it. You need that? You need a car? Fine, I got some extra money, I got some extra, I'll sell it and I'll give you a car. Right, every need was met amongst them. They did it, that's how they were described. It says they were of one heart and one mind, one purpose. That's the church at the beginning. Does that describe the church today? Should it? C.S. Lewis, a uh, famous Christian, wrote a lot of books on Christianity. He wrote one called The Screw Tape Letters, where a senior devil is, is tutoring a younger demon in how to disrupt the church, how to fight against Christianity. And he talks about how the devil wants us to think about all the things about each other that irritate us, right? He wants to bring to mind, I don't like the way that guy talks or sounds or, right? All the little things, and they're true, right? Those things exist, and the devil wants to prod those. He wants to increase those. He wants that to be at the forefront of our mind, to disrupt us, to think about the things that separate us rather than the things that unite us. And, of course, he's subtle. He wants to think that's we're thinking that. And he's the one that's, that's triggering that. Now, when my kids were little, um, sometimes, believe it or not, they would fight. They didn't get along. One might have done something to the other they should not have done. And so they're in conflict. And I would, if I was aware of it, I'd bring my children together and I'd make them make peace right then and there. So let's just say I'm, my, my son whacked my daughter on the butt, whatever. I said, and she's upset. I said, okay, why'd you do that? He had no reason. Okay, so kiss her butt. 10 times you're going to kiss her butt. And he had to do it. And that was the end of it, right? Because he did something he shouldn't do and now he made up for it. And that's the end of it, it's over, right? Because those little things can add up. They can become uh, things that they fester and they grow, right? We may not be conscious of them, but they do. They have to be dealt with. They gotta be brought out in the open. Now, what do you think God wants for his children? If I want my children to be at peace, to love one another, what do you think God wants his children to do? Does he want us to be in conflict? Or does he want us to live in, church, in, in truth and to fulfill our purpose and to love each other? And it has to start here. In other words, we have to kiss each other's butt, right? Ten times. If, if we've offended somebody, Make up, right? We have to make up. We have to get along with each other. So we have to get along with each other. And the second thing is we have to unite with Christ. Jesus talks about in this prayer, the Father and the Son, they're in perfect unity, perfect love. There's no conflict, zero, zero conflict. What would it like to be in a relationship with zero conflict? I don't know, but Jesus does. Now you and I are on shaky ground. If we love anything, more than God. If we love anything more than God, we're on shaky ground. I just want to emphasize, and Kai led us in this song this morning about how much God loves us. And I usually do not consult with Kai about the message, and yet a lot of times the songs align with the message, which is good because I want, it all should come from God, right? You don't need to hear what I have to say. I have plenty of opinions. I'm happy to share them with you. It's not going to make you 
help you in any way, but with God, what God has to say can change our lives. Now, he never, ever stops thinking about us, never. He never stops providing for us. He never stops advocating for us, fighting for us. He has planned every one of your days, every one of the days of your life. He's already planned it. It says that he oversaw the knitting together of our body in our mother's womb. From the beginning, he was there. Planned us before we were born, oversaw our formation in the womb. He says he counts all the hairs in our head. And you may think that's easier for me, but it includes ear hairs too. And then uh, I have just as much, if not more, than the rest of you. Jesus said, I want those you have given to be given to me to be where I am. Jesus wants to be with us. That's what he wants. We are precious to him. He says the death of his saints are precious to him. Why? Because they're coming home. They're coming to him. And we've had some deaths in our family recently. And we have to... It's painful to lose a loved one. And if I could suggest, that's a good thing. Can you imagine the opposite? Indifferent, somebody has died and people are indifferent, not a tear is shed. Is that a better thing? I mean, this sorrow, this sadness is a good thing. There was love, there was intimacy there. But because of Christ, we'll see them again. We'll see them again. Jesus said in verse 26, I want you to make known that the love you have for me uh, may be in them. In other words, the love that Jesus and the Father have together, he wants us to be part of it. Why? We're not perfect. We are going to bring conflict. We are going to bring conflict into that relationship. We're not like them. But he wants us there, just as they love each other. He said, I'm welcoming you in. It's like a family that adopts a, a child, right? It's not born into the family. It's adopted. They may come from a difficult background. We want you to be part of our family. That's what God said. So it's Lent. I don't know if you are aware it's Lent. Lent is a... Uh, Christian tradition, it's a time of preparation before Easter, typically 40 days, so that's why there's Fat Wednesday, no, Fat Tuesday, Fat Tuesday, where you live it up, because on Ash Wednesday, Lent begins, um, and usually fasting is encouraged, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare by fasting from something, now I want you to think about this, if time spent is a way to measure love. Time spent, if, if that's a way to measure love. If we were to look at how we've used our time, what we've spent it on, who we've spent it with, if we just looked at that individually, what conclusion would we come to about what and who we love? Thinking just about that, how we spend our time. If that's just, if it's a chart on a piece of paper, what we spend our time on, who we spend it with. What conclusion would we come to about who and what we love? Would it be, they love God, man. Would that be the conclusion? For me, I would say no. I'm sad to say no. I don't think that it would be that case. And that's why I don't encourage you to fast from something. If you're going to think about Lent, you can go ahead. That's not a bad thing. But rather think of how you can rearrange your time so that when we look back at Lent, at Easter, we could say, wow, look at how they spent their time, who they spent it with, what they spent on. Clearly, they love God. I just want to read you this last quote to close. This is from Dallas Willard. He was a, a pastor and a USC professor of philosophy. He said this, now reflect. Has your heart gone out in generous blessing to someone who has insulted or humiliated you. Can you work without thought of gain for the well-being of someone who openly despises you, maybe has told you to drop dead? Are you enthusiastically pulling for the success of someone competing with you for favor position or financial gain. That is what those possessed and permeated by God's kind of love find themselves doing. That's insanity. That's just insane. 
That is not the way the world operates, but that's what we are called to be. Now, if we can't even get along with each other, how in the world are we gonna love people who hate us? We cannot, but that's what we're called to do. That's what we're called to be. Now, I'm definitely not there. Maybe you're not either, but remember, we're being sanctified. Jesus is in the process of making us into that. And as if we make him the priority in our time and the things that we do, that's what we'll become. That's the kind of person we'll become. Would that change the world? Do you think that would stop somebody to cause and, and listen to what we have to say? I'll just tell this other quick story. And Pastor Tim Keller told this story too. He's in New York City. This woman has started coming to his church. And he had a chance just to talk to her. She wasn't a Christian. She wasn't a Christian. She just started to come to church and was curious. And he asked her, well, how would you end up coming? And he said, she told him, well, I work in television in New York City. And I made a mistake. I made a big mistake at my job. Um, it, it caused a lot of problems. But my boss went and told the people that it was his fault that, that this had happened. And she said, she went and talked to him and said, people don't usually do that, right? I was set to take the blame. And you said you were responsible, which was true. He wasn't making up. He, but nobody would have known. Nobody would have known if he had just kept his mouth shut. And he told her, look, I'm a Christian. I have to, I have to take responsibility for what I do. That... He just, did, he just did what he was supposed to do. That was the truth. He lived the truth. He was the cause. He simply said it. That was enough to attract her to God. What kind of people do this? We are meant to do that. Amen? Let's pray. Uh, thank you, Father. Your love is... Uh, it just blows my mind, Father. It just blows my mind. How desperately we need it, Father. The world desperately needs it, but we need it here as well, Father. Please, uh, may our hearts be willing to be changed and transformed. And you have a vision of who we will be, Father, and we're not there yet. But that vision, we will be people who reach out in love to those who despise us. That's exactly what you did, Jesus. You're not just telling us to do it. You did it. You, when they were nailing you to the cross, you said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, all we really have to offer is ourselves, and we do. May each of us give what we are as we are now. Transform it, sanctify it, Father, so that we become like you. I pray blessings on these people, and I thank you for them. And we ask all this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.